Dialing to Night Talk with Joe Rocks, Thursdays 10 p.m. Eastern, with audio and video replays in all, all the usual places. And to join us live, go to JoeRocksLive.com. The views and opinions of this broadcast do not reflect the views and opinions of Armed Media, Who New Productions, and its affiliates. Enjoy the show. I'm the tip of Pan Man. Tip on me. I'm the tip of Pan Man. Ain't nothing gonna stick on me. Tip on Pan Man. Tip on Pan Man. Stick on me. Yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to All You Can Eat. It's the podcast about deliciousness. I am your host, Rob Rosenthal. Very uh, glad to be with you here today for episode number 130 of All You Can Eat. And uh, if you have heard any of my work before, you know that I am uh, all about uh, recommending. I think of myself as kind of a recommendation engine or a chief recommendation officer. Last week's program, in fact, uh, I spent uh, just describing my recent experience in Morocco, a place that I, rec- a country that I recommend. Uh, you visit because it is uh, fascinating and rich and, and delicious and wonderful. And uh, today's program, I am here to speak to you about Spain. And the reason for that is because I'm also just back from Spain. Uh, being that uh, Morocco is close enough to Spain that I uh, decided to take a two-hour flight into Barcelona last weekend and visit my good friends who live there uh, for half of the year. We um, stayed in uh, in the town that they live in. It's called Sitges, S-I-T-G-E-S. Lovely little town there on the coast, uh, about 25 minutes out of the Barcelona airport. Beach community. I'll tell you about Sitges. But first, let's just, let's just talk about Spain in, in general because... You know, if well, let's put it this way. If you've been to Spain, then you know that there's a lot of greatness there. And if you haven't been, then part of this recommendation is to tell you why you may want to consider going. Because Spain is, well, it's just, it's great in so many ways. And in fact, uh, it's one of the top tourist destinations in the world. So it's consistently ranked among the most visited countries on the globe. Sometimes it's the second most, sometimes it's the third most. France is always right up there at the top. You're talking about, you, you, you know, I, I think you're talking about like 80, and this is kind of like pre-pandemic, but even so, that's going to come back. You're talking about 80, 85 million people showing up in a, in a country like that. And there's a reason for that. And if you, like I said, if you've been, you know, you may want to consider, by the way, if you've been uh, returning. Because there's a lot of there's a lot of great pieces of Spain from uh, big cities and uh, you know and coasts and uh, diff- and wine country. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you can play Spain. I'll describe some of them to you. But the point uh, here, uh, more profoundly, I suppose, is that if you have not been to Spain, uh, certainly uh, on your uh, put it on your consideration uh, uh, set because. It's a diverse country. It's a fascinating country. And really, there's something to offer every type of uh, traveler. For example, suppose you're the kind of person that goes, I- I'm into, you know, culture and history. So, you know, Spain goes back hundreds and hundreds, home to some of the most important historical landmarks and cultural heritage sites in the world. I mean, there's the Alhambra in uh, Granada, there's the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, the Prado, Prado, the Prado Museum over in uh, Madrid, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. So if you're the type of person that travels and says, hey, you know what, I want to, ta- I want to absorb some of the culture and some of the history, obviously there's plenty of that for you to enjoy in Spain. Now, what about me? Well, me, I'm, I'm going for the food and the wine. If you are a food uh, or wine uh, person, Spain has some of the most uh, glorious, world-renowned uh, food in the world. Surely you've heard of uh, tapas, small plates, dishes, bites that have become popular in, all over the place, but they really uh, not only originated there, they in fact, um, that's still to this day, you know, a huge part of, of the way that they go out. You know, I was with my friends, Frank and Natasha, there in Sitges, and 
we would meet at, you know, whatever time, seven, because, you know, they, people tend to go out late there and eat late. And then you go tapas hopping from one place to another, where one place you may go and you go, oh, they have this great, you know, short rib uh, on toast. And then there's another place that you go because they have, you know, some something that they make with, uh, you know, codfish, another place. So each place, you, so you, you know, you're half an hour in a place, you have a glass of something to drink. And I'm glad to report that the, the Spanish drink a lot of gin, which uh, I'm uh, a fan of and in favor of, so we had that. And a tapas here and a tapas there, and then you move on. You can do that for hours. And Spain also has, in addition to uh, tapas, as you know, when we're speaking about food and wine, paella, that incredible dish, a uh, rice-based dish, uh, sometimes with seafood, sometimes with chicken, sometimes with sausage, just... Um, depending really actually on the part of Spain that you're in, because each you know, area has kind of its local specialty. And Spain has uh, churros, which, <laughs> you know, if you're a sweets person, it's that, uh, it's that uh, longish rod. Well, it's not a rod because it's thicker than that, but it's a, it's a donut. It just happens to be straight, right? Deep fried and, and uh, you know, sugar on the outside and crispy on the outside a little bit and then soft on the inside and while the while the churro and they can I've seen them run long like you know they could be six inches they could be eight they could be ten whatever they are you you'll recognize them they have the the uh, crystal the crystallized sugar on top of them and while they're amazing to eat on their own you know what else is great in Spain is their hot chocolate um, so thick that you you know eat it like with a spoon and you could take a churro, as people do, and they dip it into their chocolate. And ladies and gentlemen, you will have some very happy taste buds. Spain is also understandably famous for its wine. And you have wine regions there, like the Rioja region and the Ribera del Duero and Priorat, where they're doing the sparkling kind of cava, which is competitive with champagne and delicious. Went to a tasting. I'll tell you about that later. Spain, my friends, beautiful beaches, 5,000 miles of coastline, some of the nicest beaches in all of Europe, in San Sebastian, San Sebastian in, uh, in Ibiza, which you may have heard of, in Barceloneta, that's outside of Barcelona, uh, so, and in Sitges, you know, that's, that's, you know, you're eating, you know, even in the middle of the winter, I mean, I was there, what, the last part of February, the early, early part of uh, March, even at, even at that point, which is kind of the dead of winter, you know when the sun comes out in the middle of the day and it's 50, 55, so you're wearing a sweater or whatever, and you're sitting on the water and it's warm in the sun and you're having a glass of vermouth, which I did not yet mention because they have great vermouth. The kind of drink, you know, it's that funny thing about vermouth. You don't really think of it not that much here in the United States unless you're making a martini, then you need vermouth. No, no, not over there. When you're going on your tapas tour, your tapas tasting, your tapas hopping, you know, there are places that, they serve like six, ten different uh, types of, of vermouth, and it's delicious uh, on ice and dressed. You know, here's a couple of olives, here's uh, pieces of lemon and lime and orange. I mean, this is fantastic. Anyway, the point being that uh, plenty of beautiful beaches in, uh, in Spain. So depending on the time of year you go, you know, you're going to see some, some action over there. And Spain also is quite famous for its you know, festivals, celebrations, you have like the running of the bulls, you have different types of festivals. Uh, you know, they had just finished, uh, what do they call the one that I was, that I just missed over there in Citrus? It's not like, um, it's not like in New Orleans, it's not like Mardi Gras, but they, they have like a super, and these people go all out. I mean, that's the point. It's parades. It's people dressing up. It's music. It's crazy. So you may want to consider showing up in uh, some part of Spain during some f festival in the season, and there's a lot of them, because you really get a taste of, of, uh, of, of life the way they live it. That's the thing that will always impress me, by the way, about a culture, is uh, their willingness uh, to celebrate. So I think of Spain, and I think of all the festivals they have, and they do them with some uh, regularity, because these are people who are going, hey, you know what? We're here to have a good time. Life is good. Let's celebrate. Uh, we go out uh, late at night. We're going to have a, a, some vermouth and some tapas. Uh, uh, we're going to wake up not so early the next day. We may take a siesta in the afternoon. 
and then we're going to enjoy ourselves on the weekend. So culturally speaking, you know, you're at a place where people really uh, enjoy and take advantage of, of life, and I like that. Suppose you're a person, I'm back to, you know, some of the many reasons to hop over. If you're a person that says, hey, you know what, I'm interested in architecture, I mean, there's, uh, there's Gaudi uh, in, in Barcelona, and then there's, you know, Gothic cathedrals, and then there's the Roman aqueduct in Segovia. I, you know, people don't talk about Segovia because it's not one of the top four or five uh, uh, cities. I happen to have been on, not this trip, on my last trip to Segovia. And, you know, I was taken there because they, uh, they have a Ro Roman ruins, an old aqueduct that you can see. An aqueduct in and of itself is an amazing architectural feat because it's how the Romans and the, and the Greeks before them figured out how to get drinking water, get water, without which there is no city, there is no life. And so you see this uh, great architecture, for example, in uh, this Roman aqueduct in Segovia, and, and that was not the highlight for me. The highlight for me was a restaurant in Segovia, which is easy enough to find, and if ever you're interested because you go, this sounds good to me, Rob, just get me, hit me up on uh, realrobrosenthal.com. You can reach me that way and say, hey, what's the restaurant there in Segovia? where you had the roast baby pig that was so soft after hours of cooking on the spit that they sliced it with a plate. It was um, easily uh, the best uh, pork product that I've ever had, I'm, I'm happy to report. Anyway, that was in Segovia, Spain. And here I am talking about the architecture. <laughs> the architecture of the pig. They have flamenco dancing. You're going to see that if you happen to go to um, Spain and even uh, decide to participate yourself, take a lesson. Uh, and, and, and also, you know, music that goes with that great guitar, uh, history of guitar uh, music in that country. They have, um, it's a sports crazy country, and obviously more than anything, they love their, uh, their football, their soccer. So if you're lucky enough to be there at a time that the soccer season is going on, you can go to into a stadium and catch a game, which is always an exciting thing to do when you travel. You always try to do something that feels like, you know, you're living like a local. And one of those things is maybe using the um, one of those things is maybe using the uh, the public transportation. Another thing is potentially going to a sporting event. I remember being in um, t uh, in Tokyo and found the the subway line to be clean and efficient and fantastic. I took it one night to the ballpark to watch a baseball game. And it was amazing to me to be in a baseball game in Japan. And, you know, when they were serving, they weren't coming around with hot dogs. You know, they were coming around with Japanese food and Japanese beer. And uh, it's just, a, it's just a, a kick. It's just a panic. You know, you're going to another country and, uh, and taking advantage of things that you cannot take advantage of on your own. So more than anything, you know, when I recommend travel, it's because I'm, I'm recommending it for the adventure, for the... Uh, you know, get outside of the comfort zone, see and feel and experience things that you haven't before in your daily routine, whether that be the art or the architecture, the culture, the sports, whatever, or in my case, you know, the food and wine. And finally, you know, Spain overall has some really beautiful natural landscapes in, in, outside of Madrid, outside of Barcelona, the Pyrenees Mountains in the forests of Galicia, a lot of beautiful places to explore in that part of the country. So, Again, uh, the overall recommendation is Spain. Now, what I'm going to do is break it down a little bit because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend as much time on uh, or any time really on Madrid. That's that's the biggest city, and it's the you know it's the it's the business city, and it's the commerce city, and it's the most city of all the cities. Uh, nothing wrong with Madrid. You're gonna go and you're gonna go to some of the great museums in the world, and you're gonna have extraordinary food there. And you will see fabulous things in Madrid. But Madrid is really, you know, all about the city. Whereas Barcelona, uh, also vibrant and cosmopol uh, cosmopolitan, uh, you know, is in the northeast region of Spain. It's part of uh, what they call uh, Catalonia. And it's on the water over there. So it's a, it's a different... It's a slightly different type of experience. Now, Barcelona happens to be known for 
some of its architecture, the famous works of uh, Antoni Gaudi, like the Sagrada Familia uh, and those things in Barcelona. You're going to want to check those out. And the beaches uh, outside of Barcelona are really great, and that includes Barceloneta, which I mentioned, and some other ones, Marbella, these kind of things. Popular not only with locals but tourists and great place to kind of hang and take in the sun and, again, you know, living it like a local. Uh, nice sparkling cava during the day at the beach, some light bites, some beautiful seafood. And, you know, speaking of which, Barcelona, you know, great food scene. You have some of the Catalan, uh, the, uh, the Catalan cuisine, which I'll tell you about later. There's going to be international cuisine. And you're going to have down there, of course, not only the tapas and, and the paella, but I'm going to say this at the risk of uh, offending any of my uh, Italian friends and fans. You can get great ham uh, in so many places around the world, and that includes our own country, America, uh, you know, where there's super hams and, you know, out of Kentucky and all of the, we have, we have great, we have a lot of great ham in this country. Uh, we just do. But you can get great ham in France. You can get great ham in Germany. Uh, Black Forest ham, for example. You can great, get great ham in a whole lot of countries, including, by the way, as we all know, Italy, where they are producing the world-famous uh, prosciutto, the Parma. So there's Parma, Italy, one of the greatest eating cities in the world. And there they are raising the most extraordinary uh, pigs, and there they are producing incredible prosciutto, and it's great. Nobody's going to argue with that. But uh, your friend Rob, uh, your chief recommendation officer, is here to tell you that if I had to choose one place to eat ham, it's going to be Spain. The uh, jamón ibérico, the Spanish ham is uh, amazing, and uh, you can't help but notice. Now, again, I'm last weekend I'm in Sitges, but even though it's a <clears throat> you know small village, there are stores that you go into, shops that sell one item only. They sell ham. I mean, you may have fifty different varieties to choose from, and they'll slice them right there. But man, I'll tell you, if you like ham, you you are hard pressed to find better ham anywhere in the world than you're going to get in Spain. I, I will uh, point out to you that there was a particular meal that I had at, at a restaurant we went to for lunch where we had a variety of, uh, of plates, because that's the way you eat over there. And one of them was a plate of ham. Uh, let me see if it's on my receipt here. Hamon, hamon, paleta belota. Yeah, that's what I wanted to find out. There's uh, Iberico ham, and that's a general rule, but then we had the Belota, B-E-L-L-O-T-A. I will say that as I'm eating this ham, uh, on its own, I mean, when I say on its own, I didn't put it on a piece of bread, I didn't put it on anything, you just, you take a slice of it, and you see the meaty part, and you see the fatty part, and you have it all together, and I'm tasting it, and I'm going, I literally said out loud, do these pigs, these Belota pigs, do they eat chestnuts? And the answer was no. They eat acorns. I asked the question because I tasted in tasting the ham. I was tasting exactly what that pig was exclusively fed on. Uh, you know, it's interesting the way food works. When you're eating grass-fed, for example, cows, they have a different uh, feel and taste than do the cows that are raised on, uh, on corn, for example, like in America. When you're eating certain uh, seafood, fish, that live on other seafood or fish, oftentimes you get some sense of what those fish had eaten before. When you, when you eat Kobe beef, the world's kind of most expensive, but again, these, these cows are being fed, like again, beer, and acorns, and they're being massaged, etc., etc. <clears throat> the point being that in eating the Belota ham, I tasted, uh, I tasted like acorn. Uh, extraordinary, extraordinary. I'm back to Barcelona, and it's nightlife, right? You're the kind of person 
young, old, whatever you are, you want to go out at night, you want to see a light night, nightlife scene, you want to go to a bar, you want to go to a club, you want to hear live music, Barcelona. Beautiful mix of eclectic bars and clubs. Barcelona culture, Picasso Museum, you want to, want to go there, you want to go to the Moreau Foundation, and, and as I said, you, you go at certain times when, uh, you know, when they're having festivals, fantastic. Sports, uh, also, as in Spain, Barcelona uh, hosted the 1992 Olympics, plenty of facilities, plenty of venues, plenty of people working out, plenty of sporting events, and, uh, and overall, again, uh, Barcelona, terrific, food, culture, nightlife, uh, a lot of things to see and do, and a, 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 a train ride uh, and, a, and an Uber ride or a bus ride of less than a half an hour to get yourself to Sitges, S-I-T-G-E-S, coastal town, 35 kilometers southwest of Barcelona, 35 kilometers, you're looking at 20 miles, basically, and it's such a, it's such a cool little coastal uh, town, and, you know, the people there are, they're happy, like they're nice, they say hello, they, they know each other, because it's not a big place, and, you know, you recognize, you've been to some of these little towns before, where the streets are a little bit narrow, and, and, and there's some cobblestone, and there's some shops, and then you start getting those incredible smells. Just a fun little place, uh, even if you go just for kind of like a weekend, like you, if, if, you know, Spain, you go to Spain, you could go, hey, you know what, let me spend a weekend in Sitges and see what that's like, because you're right on the beach. You walk to the beach from your hotel, and and it's pretty, and it's nice, and, uh, you know, you're, on the, you're in the Mediterranean, and again, you know, you're eating good people, uh, good food, good everything, and a lot of festivals. And and by the way, in in Sitges, I've got to say also uh, too for those inclined to uh, the L LGBT. I mean, it's um, uh, gay pride festivals. There's a, a huge population there in Sitges, homosexual uh, a community, and and just a, a uh, just a, a lot of happiness and a lot of fun and a lot of camaraderie. And a lot of parades and festivals, and, and, and uh, let's face it, those parades and festivals are something spectacular with the dress and, and all that kind of stuff. Architecture you'll see over there, new, now note, noteworthy, picturesque, you know, like I said, narrow streets winding around, great nightlife, bars, obviously, uh, the food, uh, amazing. I mentioned to you the, uh, the Spanish ham. I also had, when I was there in Sitges, we had, let's see, patatas. Yeah, Sitges has their own brand of potato chips. I thought they were amazing. Copa Chivite Rosado. Yeah, the rosé uh, wine was great. The Verdejo wine, excellent. Let's see, pan con... Oh, yeah, pan con tomate. That is a specialty of that region of Catalonia uh, and in other parts of Spain where you take a beautiful piece of bread and you toast it and you uh, rub a little garlic on it, and then you rub tomato on it, and then you spray it with a little olive oil, and life is complete. I mean, I, you, you, you can make a meal out of it if you can. Uh, I had a hard time stopping eating that. Pan con tomate, when those tomatoes are good, with that oil, olive oil that they have in Spain, a little hit of garlic on a toasty piece of chewy bread, that is just um, gorgeous food. I just love that. Cigalas frescas. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and almejas, clams, and cigalas. I don't know. I'm going to say that I had there something that was not like crayfish, not like lobster, not like shrimp. If lobster married shrimp, um, I had it, and I had it grilled, and they grilled it simply, and it comes right out of that shell, and it's better than lobster, and it's better than shrimp, and it's just gorgeous food. Gorgeous food, going down with some sparkling cava and some pan con tomate, and you know, um, it's the eating there is um, spectacular. I also ordered, and I'm happy to report this, uh, something called molleja. And I, I did it because having been to Argentina a number of times, I am a fan of Molleja. Now, don't be, 
uh, either surprised or turned off by this. I mean, some people have a problem eating the uh, the innards, uh, the offal, the organ meat, whatever you want to call it. Moyecha is the thymus gland, and it sounds disgusting, but I'm going to tell you something. When you when you grill it up, and it gets crispy on the outside and stays kind of creamy on the inside, it is fantastic, fantastic eating. Now, because we were in Sitches, and we were not far from wine uh, country, so we took a little side trip. Let's call it a half an hour. I mean, it's not that far. And we took a trip over to a winery called pa- Perez Balta, P-A-R-E-S. Looks like pears. Balta, B-A-L-T-A. And we took a, you know, they take you around on a tour of the place, and then you take a tasting. And that tasting itself, I don't know what the what the price was on that because I was a guest on that one. But whatever it was, I'm, I'm going to say that it's worth it because... You know, even though they put one of those spit buckets on the um, on the table for us, because when people taste wines, three, six, nine, twelve wines, whatever they're inclined, I mean, you know, professionally speaking, you're supposed to swirl around in your mouth and then spit it out. Trust me, uh, spitting is for quitters. None of us are spitting out any other wine. They were giving us a really nice pour, and you start off with some of their cava, which is the sparkling uh, sparkling wine that they make there in uh, in Spain. Delicious, and so I would say, look. You know, competitive with French Champagne. Obviously, French Champagne is special in its own way, but the closest that you can get to it is is the uh, method champagne. Was the method to make champagne, which is what they use to make cava, and it's just wonderful, and it's light, and uh, and it's bubbly, and it's crispy, and it goes well certainly with food, and is normally consumed, you know, prior to the meal. So we tried some cava. Then we had some delicious whites. Then we probably tried some rosés. Then we tried some reds. And you don't want to be drinking all of that stuff without having anything in your stomach. So they brought over beautiful little pieces of kind of like cheese and, and little crackers and little salami. And let me tell you something. I, you know, people say to me all the time, like, what's your, what's your favorite meal, Mr. Food Guy? And, uh, I, I, you know, I don't, I, can't, I don't even know what my favorite meal is, but I, I am inclined to happy hour. And I saw this uh, vi- uh, vineyard and this uh, whole wine tasting experience as that kind of thing. You know, just drinking wine and having some crunchy things with some cheese and some salami. Uh, you know, that's, that's a good life right there. We took it, however, to a restaurant out there in the countryside uh, and ended up having glorious food, I, I would say, of the standouts. There was an enormous platter of, uh, uh, of steak that they had cut up and served beautifully. There were, uh, there were some roasted duck breast. They, they uh, roasted it with some kind of like orange because the oranges are great in, uh, in, uh, all throughout uh, Spain. Oranges and prune. Uh, but I, I think the standout dish for me was something that I think they would call like soupy rice with lobster. So you have this rice that's kind of like paella rice but not firm like paella, it's more in kind of a broth, and that broth is fla- favorite, uh, flavored with the, uh, the lobster. Extraordinary dish, great wine, uh, and super prices. Uh, I mean, honestly, uh, I think five of us ate like pigs, like nonstop, and it included dessert, crema catalena, what you might consider to be kind of a Catalan cream. Uh, 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 what are the French? Uh, you know what I'm talking about. It's like creme, uh, creme caramel, like that kind of thing. Fantastic. Five of us ate like pigs. It was 150 bucks, $30 a person, and couldn't eat the rest of the day or night because that was a lot of food and a lot of really, uh, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm kind of excited about the food in that part of the world. Right, so Sitges, overall, again, beautiful, uh, charming, uh, delicious, happy, fun. You could do it as a day trip. You could do it as a weekend in, in, in or outside of, of, of Barcelona. And when you're in, whether you're in Barcelona or whether you're in Sitges, you're in the region in the northeast of Spain called Catalonia, which is... N- it's so distinct that they actually speak their own language over there, but you're going to make sure that you're going to get that pan con tomate, uh, you know, uh, bread, rub, ripe tomato, drizzle, olive oil, salt, fantastic. Uh, you may want to get uh, their, uh, you know, there's a classic dish of Catalan uh, grilled sausages served with white beans. They do a seafood paella that they make with noodles instead of rice. I, I was lucky to be there in a season where they were serving what they call calzote, uh, which is like a um, like a spring onion, and they grill them and serve them with a nice uh, sauce on the side. So, again, this part of the country, uh, great, uh, uh, certainly great eating and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And you may also, I didn't do it on this trip, but uh, as I said, you know, there are uh, a 
whole lot of different parts of Spain, and I remember really liking Sevilla, Seville, they call Sevilla down there, which, is, uh, which has a history that goes way back to the Roman era, and, and I'm talking about 12th century, and then, you know, and then it was kind of further developed by the Catholic monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, now we're talking about 1492, just about when they sent Columbus over to uh, look into America. Sevilla, a great, important cultural and economic center in Spain, and you're going to see some super sites there, but again, part of the charm of Sevilla for me was a very walkable city, uh, small uh, streets, lovely hotels, and of course, uh, fantastic food, which, by the way, includes, because I hadn't mentioned it yet, um, you know, it's where you're going to go have gazpacho. And they make, their despa- they make their gazpacho in a couple of ways. You, you know, there's the tomato, cucumber, pepper, and bread, great. Then they make one that's white where they're using almonds. Great soup over there. Uh, a, a, a ton of, of shrimp. So some, they have a famous dish where they do like a shrimp omelet. And again, I will remind you that uh, anywhere you are in Spain, but also in Sevilla, you get your hand on some of those churros that they serve with a hot chocolate. Uh, and sometimes that's breakfast, and sometimes it's late night, and whatever. And you got a great nightlife scene in Sevilla too. Again, punctuated by kind of like bars and all that kind of stuff. So uh, a lovely, uh, a lovely city. No matter what you're interested in down there, smaller. I think probably the fourth largest city or fifth largest city in Spain. So you know, you have your Madrid, and you have your uh, Barcelona, and you have your Sevilla, and you have, you know. And here's another one, by the way, that I'm going to throw in just because I happen to have been there. Oh, I know, I mentioned it. It's Segovia, uh, which is m- maybe, you know, a place that you pop into just as we did to take a look at the ruin and have some roast pig. But it's also, if you happen to be a wine person and you want to explore wine country, then Spain, uh, Abadia del Retuerte. Again, if you need the information, get in touch with me, realrobrosenthal.com. Abadia del Retuerte uh, is like a 13th century abbey, and it is super high-end now. Uh, not only can you stay there, but it also turns out to be a place that's a, a vineyard and a winery. And so if you go to that part of Spain, I would say a couple of hours outside of Madrid, which you can go by car or by train, you're in the, uh, you could travel the wine country of Rioja or Ribera del Duero, and you can go on one of those type of trips where you, you know, you go winery to winery, you do tasting down there, or you do even better than that, in my uh, case, which would be to, you know, get yourself a bike trip in that part of the world. So, ladies and gentlemen, that kind of is the, uh, is the story. I uh, had a marvelous time in a place called Sitges outside of Barcelona. But anywhere you go uh, in, uh, in Spain, and I have to say, uh, also as a general rule, I-, I felt like the prices were good. People talk a lot about how Portugal is not so expensive. I will say that the pricing of things in Spain is generally really good. I mean, don't get me wrong, hotels at the high end are still going to be super expensive. But I, I felt like as far as eating and drinking, uh, there was a reasonable reasonableness to it. You know, I go into stores in the United States of America, get a bottle of water for $2.50, which really pisses me off. But there I was, having a half a liter of uh, water in any kind of market in Spain for 50 cents. So, uh, and, and like I said, five of us eating a lot of food for not a ton of money. So uh, I think good, certainly value for the money. And everything else that I said about Spain is true. Uh, you can't, you kind of can't go wrong depending exactly on the type of trip that you that you design for yourself. That, uh, my friends, is about what I wanted to describe here in episode 130 of All You Can Eat, my recommendation on Spain. If you want to hear more about uh, why I thought Morocco was so outstanding, that's in last week's episodes. And you can find these episodes uh, live, not only on on Radio Global. Uh, We run live on Wednesday nights at 9 o'clock. But then the program is archived on all of the uh, major podcast sites, and that includes iHeartRadio and Spotify. It includes uh, Audible and Amazon and YouTube. You're going to be able to find All You Can Eat, and uh, I will be there behind this microphone, oftentimes uh, here by myself in recommendation mode, and oftentimes also in conversation with other folks, whether they be 
writers or journalists or cooks or chefs or celebrities or whatever in conversation about the things that make life delicious. That is the very nature of all you can eat. My thanks again to the guys up at On Radio Global. Ladies and gentlemen, Wednesday nights, you can hear talk shows on uh, On Radio Global all the time. Thursday nights, a lot of live talk going on down there. And as I said, plenty of places for you to go ahead and find uh, all you can eat on your, uh, whatever your podcast channels are. I'm Rob Rosenthal, your recommendation engine, coming to you uh, week in, week out, uh, with a report on uh, the things that are delicious. Should you be so inclined, my friends, find me at realrobrosenthal.com, ask me questions, come to some of my classes that I give on cooking for the 92nd Street Y in New York City, New York, and grab a copy of my book. It's called Short Order Dad. I don't know why I hesitated. I should know the name of my own book. Short Order Dad, One Guy's Guide to Making Food Fun and Hassle-Free. It's a cookbook, but it's more than that. It's a how-to cook book in which I explain to you uh, all the cooking techniques that you need to know, uh, delicious food at home, getting the most taste with the fewest ingredients and the least and the least effort. That is my method, ladies and gentlemen. Until next time, uh, I bid you farewell, and I remind you, life is short, so never waste a meal. I'm the Teflon Pan Man. Teflon Man. I'm the Teflon Pan Man. Ain't nothing gonna stick on me. Teflon Pan Man. Teflon Pan Man. Stick on me. You are listening to... Armed Radio Global, home of Night Talk, with Joe Rocks. Thursdays, 10 p.m. Eastern, and you can find us all in the usual places. Armed Radio Global.